Hello, I'm Atuba George and I'm so blessed to be bringing God's truth to you today. Now, today is Friday and this marks the end of the week. Praise God. And we've been talking all month about the, the knowledge of God. And why is it so important to go for knowledge? Now, what knowledge? The knowledge of God. Now, you see, whatever you study, whatever um, academics you put yourself through, it's important that you understand this one thing, the God who created you. Why is it so important? Why have we been hammering on this all month? Because, you see, number one, God created you and everything about you came from him. Everything about the life you live came from him. Everything about the environment you live from, you know, God created the heavens and the earth, except you don't believe that. Now, if you don't believe that, that's your issue, praise God. But you see, you would end up finding out that this is true. Now, the thought about whether God exists or not have gone beyond um, um, people discussions that it's been established that God exists. Anyone who's still thinking that God does not exist is only deceiving himself. That's the simple truth. There's been some documentary evidence that prove that there must be a God. And people, oh, I don't believe that. It doesn't matter if you believe it or not. See, one day you will get to believe. And those who have believed don't believe or didn't believe because they were fooled or fools. No. There is something, and, and that's what I've been telling you. We don't just believe because we were told. Or sometimes, you know, people go, oh, because you were raised up that way. No, sir. We have had our own experiences with God. And so when, when we believe in God, and all of us, of course, when we believe in God, see, there are two things. There are those of us who have had our own personal experience, what we call personal encounters with God. And, and these are... These are not things that you can dispute. See, what you have experienced, you have experienced it. Nobody can tell you you didn't experience what you experienced. Sometimes people may try to make you downplay on the experience you had, okay? For example, somebody who has been healed supernaturally will not go out there and, and accusing people of, the, of lying when they say they were healed, you see? Yes, somebody who have prospered financially by God will not go out there and say, um, God does not prosper people, see? He'll be lying to himself. But then somebody can come and tell that same person, if the person lacks understanding, that it's not really God that prospered you, see? Um, you need to understand that uh, it was this person that you met and this person that you met. and they, But you know in your heart that when those things transacted, when those, those, things, um, those things happened, you know that a lot of information you have today, you didn't have it as a then. And you know at that point, you knew that there was some measure of supernatural intervention in the matter. Okay, now if you stick with your truth, nobody can deceive you. That's just how simple it is. But if you if you let go of your truth, which is your faith, if you let go, Paul said something in Colossians chapter two, I think from verse six. He says, "As you have received Christ Jesus, so walk ye in Him, being rooted and grounded." You who have received Jesus Christ. How did you receive him? Did you receive him for him? Or did you receive Christ Jesus because of a church? Now you see, that's another angle. There are people who are saved because of a church. Now you take those people outside of that church environment, they will lose their salvation. There are people like that. But there are people who actually have encountered Jesus Christ. You see, these people, put them anywhere they will still keep their faith in Jesus Christ. That's why you find people who are always telling, oh, these other people are wrong. These other people are wrong. Our own is right. They didn't encounter Jesus. Those who have encountered Jesus have a broader view of things. Yes. Because see, the more, when I mean encounter Jesus, you know, there are people who encounter Jesus and then they, they dropped off that encounter and adopted a religious system. Yes, there are people like that. And that's why you must be very careful with your faith. When you got saved, 
No man saved you. Someone may have preached to you. Someone may have um, um, made an altar call and, and then you responded to that altar call. But listen, that person did not save you. Because the same way many others encountered that or went for that altar call, and their lives didn't change. Nothing happened. In fact, they went back to their sin immediately. You see? So that's to tell you that it is not the person who made the altar call that brings salvation. It is the Spirit of God that does the work of salvation. Now, if you have been saved, and you know you have been saved, we call it assurance of salvation. And let me tell you, nobody can teach you what the assurance of salvation is. You only know it in yourself. If you have encountered Christ, you have encountered him. It's not the rituals that we go through, what that baptism is. You say, ah, I was baptized by so, so, and so person. That means my salvation is concrete. No, sir. It doesn't mean that way. <laughs> it's God. Even if Jesus physically on earth baptized you, it doesn't mean your salvation is concrete. The only way, yes, I made that statement. I said it. Praise God. What do you mean? Even if Jesus is, oh yes, Jesus had the disciples called Judas Iscariot. Have you forgotten? And Judas Iscariot was a sinner from the beginning, remained a sinner. Even after Jesus died, he went to kill himself. He died a sinner. No transformation in his life. Yet Judas did miracles like the other disciples. He, he cast out devils. He healed the sick when Jesus sent them. Because the Bible said they all came back with testimonies. Yet Judas was not saved. People don't know this. People feel, ah, he just made a mistake that anybody could have made. No, Jesus specifically chose Judas for that purpose. You need to get this. Judas didn't make a mistake that any other person could make. Judas did what he did because it was his character to do so. And Jesus, knowing this, chose him for that purpose. So why would Jesus choose someone? You see, because it was written of Jesus that one of his disciples will betray him. And listening to me, I cover it every this will this will lead us into something I don't think I want us to go into yet. Because today is Friday, no time to explain it. But let me just give you a short version of it. There is no one that God created. I want you to put this in your mind. Maybe later we'll talk about it. There is no one God created with a bad destiny like the type of Judas Iscariot. I want you to think about it. Why would God create somebody and say, your own assignment in life is to betray the savior of the world. Why do you think God would do so? Now, if God did something like that, he would have created and ensured a salvation plan afterwards. Okay? Yes. Number two, did you realize that Jesus spoke about two people before he went to the cross? He spoke about the one who betrayed him, then he spoke about the one who will deny him. That's Peter. Peter later denied him. And he spoke directly to Peter. He says, hey, you will deny me. And he made a statement in the book of Luke. He says, Simon, Simon, Satan has desired to have you. And his job is that he will sift you as wheat. Then Jesus said, but I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you are converted, strengthen the brethren. Jesus said concerning Peter, I have prayed for you so that your faith will not fail in the face of that trial. And then you are going to be converted. And when you are converted, not as when you are restored, strengthen the other brethren. Clear. Now he was warned, Peter was warned by Jesus that this thing is going to happen. And I believe that helped Peter's faith a lot when he went through that challenges. But look at on the other side. Jesus said concerning Judas Iscariot, he said, one of you will betray me. And then what did he say next? And he says, it was better for that one that he was never born. These are two disciples. I want you to think, like I said, we'll talk about this another time. I want you to think, why would Jesus say, so one of you will betray me. And then he didn't say, but I have prayed for you, just like he said concerning Peter, that your faith should not fail when you are converted. Now, in, 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 if you want to place the two crime or sin according to weight, of course, we don't do that. Sin is sin. But I'm just trying to say, why would Jesus pray for one 
and condemn the other, okay? And so you look at their both sins, Judas betrayed him in terms of he collected money and brought the people who wanted to arrest Jesus to a secret place where they can get him without much crowd. Okay? That has been the challenge of the Jews. How do we get Jesus, see, that the crowd will not know? Because if we take him with the crowd, they will kill us or they will, they will, there will be an opera. But can we take him? So Judas only sold an information to them for money. That there is this place Jesus used to go and pray. I will take you there. When you get there in the middle of the night, when you get there, you can take him quietly. And that's exactly, he collected money for it. But you see, Peter actually denied Jesus. I never knew him. Now, I ask you the question, which is stronger, which is worse of the two? But now you find Jesus praying for Peter and condemning Judas. So, before they even did anything wrong. Jesus prayed for Peter before he did anything wrong. Jesus condemned Judas before he did anything wrong. He says, it is better for that one that he was never born. Why am I telling you this? Jesus chose Judas from the beginning. He more like pastored Judas, but then Judas was still condemned, okay? So you don't say because Jesus baptized me physically, you know, so I am saved. My salvation is strong. No, sir. No. The work of salvation is the work of the Holy Spirit. And while the Holy Spirit is doing that salvation, you will be responding to him. How do you respond to him? This is what he does. He brings the knowledge of God to you and then you respond with that knowledge by your actions, which is your faith. Okay? So he, he brings the revelation of God to you. You examine it. You believe it. And because you believe it, you begin to take decisions accordingly. Now, those decisions you begin to take accordingly is what enhances eternal life in you. Please understand what I'm sharing with you because sometimes when we talk about these things, people think you are just being religious. You know, I've heard people tell you, you are too religious in your teachings. Sometimes talk about life issues. Talk about, but we are talking about life issues. Yes, but he said we don't deal with life issues from the end point. We deal with life issues from the first point, which is the point of decision making. If the knowledge of God is in your heart, it will help the decisions you make on a daily basis. And if I can affect the decisions you make on a daily basis, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to be affecting the outcome of your life. If I can affect your appetite... I won't have to force you to go to the gym later on. You see? If I can affect your appetite, so you, you, you train your appetite to know that, look, we don't take this, we don't take this, we don't take this, we don't take this, we don't take this. I'll be, I'll be, I'll be able to make you live a healthy life. So the same thing, if I can affect your appetite spiritually or, or mentally, then I will affect your decision making. If I affect your decision making, I'll, I'll be saving myself and you from the outcome of negative and wrong decisions that we'll have to spend the whole life trying to repair. So this is why the knowledge of God is so important. I'll, I'll give you an illustration in the scriptures. Now, I told you something last week. I said, we were talking, no, not, not like a few days ago. I was teaching you, I said, the physical works we do, even for God, never use that to tell how great a person you are. The only way you can tell that you're doing well with God is how much of his knowledge you have received and you are currently still receiving. You see, when it comes to the knowledge of God, there is nothing like, I have arrived. No, you can never arrive. You're talking about one who, who lives in eternity. And how long have you lived? maybe 100 years, and you're thinking, I've arrived. No, you haven't. There is still more to learn. There is still more to know. And even at 100, there are still decisions to make. Yes. Now, I'll give you two illustrations. God called Moses and Aaron. Aaron was the brother of Moses, and God called him. You know the whole story when God told Moses will go to Egypt and then he was busy struggling. And God then said, you know what? Okay, I'm joining your brother to your calling. So your brother will speak for you since you're saying you cannot speak. Your brother will speak for you. And they 
accepted the ministry and they began to carry on the ministry. They went to Egypt. You know all the wonders Moses and Aaron did, Aaron did in Egypt. And they came out of Egypt, all the miraculous signs, all the mistakes they made. You know, Aaron was the one that built that golden calf. When Moses went up the mountain, they forced him to build it. Now, uh, all the mistakes they made, all the miracles they saw, all the good things that happened to them. At the end of the day, God said to both of them, you remember when God says, the people had complained for water, okay? And they they went before the Lord and said, God, these people, they, they are so, I mean, I don't understand them. Can you imagine the answer? God said, not a problem. Um, you give them water to drink. Now you go to the rock, take your rod with you, go to the rock and speak to the rock and water will come out. The rock will give it a lot. No, hey, come on, let's not go there. Praise God. We will not be distracted to the Holy Spirit. Thank you. Help us. Praise God. I can never defradish kabad nahaya. Let's not go there. All right. So God said to Moses, take up your rod and speak to the rock. Go and read there. If you see what, what got me excited, maybe to bless you. What God said about the rock. When you speak to the rock, this is what the rock will. Go and read it for yourself. It's in the book of Numbers. Now, Moses went and he was angry with the people. Then he took his rod and struck the rock twice and the bible said water came out from the rock but then after that god spoke called moses and aaron i said hey you guys um you've done something wrong and because of this both of you will not enter into the promised land yeah and what did god say they did wrong god said you did not magnify me before the people that cost Moses and Aaron entering into the destiny that God spoke to them about. God had told them you will bring these people into the promised land. By that action, they missed their opportunity. So God told Aaron, you go up the mountain. Moses, take him up. He will go and die there. Collect his, his priestly robe and put it on his son. And then he followed Moses and then he died there. He was buried. He took his stuff. And, and then Moses, you know the story of Moses. God said, look, look at the land. He saw it now. Go up to the mountain. I'll handle you there. And, and Moses followed the Lord and followed him up to the mountain. And God fixed him up. Now, God said, you did not magnify me before the people. See, they got to the end, the end point of their ministry. And God disqualified them. Why? What did God mean by you did not magnify me before the people? You, you, you didn't know me. And so you didn't apply the knowledge of me in that decision you made. What did they do wrong? God was not angry for them asking for water. But they were angry and presented it as though God was angry. And God says, no, Moses. So, because that decision to strike the rock instead of obeying what God said. Because if they had obeyed the Lord, the people would have seen another angle, another side of God. Every act we do for the Lord shows people his nature, shows people his character. We bring them into his knowledge, okay? So they struck the rock and they struck it in anger. The people saw them angry so they were drinking that water man uh, well at least we have water to drink if god is angry with us that's his business <laughs> you understand but god was never angry with them he said hey give them water they are thirsty see so they they missed entering the promised land because of the knowledge of god that they did not express if they had it now look at another person a person of apostle paul Apostle Paul was called by Jesus Christ, done great works. And then here is Paul at the end, towards the end of his ministry, writing to the church. He says, everything I have attained in life, I count it as dung. I put it aside. For what? For one thing. For the excellency of the knowledge of him. Now that's where he says, that I might know him. That I may know him. That I may know him. Now, why would a man at that point, the peak, at the highest point of his life, 
come to the point that says, man, forget everything I have done. Forget everything I have gained. I have realized something. I need to know him. What did he see? What did he understand? Don't pride yourself in the work you do for the Lord. Pride yourself rather in how much of him you are being given access to. And nobody can do that for you. The Holy Spirit is the only one that can do that for you. Praise God. So while I teach you these things, pay attention closely. And spend time with the Holy Spirit. Say, Lord, maybe I've taken this thing for granted. But I really, I really think I need to know you. You see, if short prayer like that brings your request and your sincere heart to the Lord, the Holy Spirit takes it over and he begins a journey with you. Based on your day-to-day activities, he'll begin to point out the knowledge of God to you. And as you grow in his knowledge, see, it's, it's going to affect because of Moses' decision, which influenced his actions, he lost his opportunity. Okay? And Paul must have seen things that made him say, take that decision. Look, everything I have gained, put it aside. I want to know him. You don't have to wait till the last point of your life to realize this. You can realize it today that, see, the knowledge of him is not the teaching of him. What I teach you is a fraction of what I know of him. Yes. And I cannot take the work I do more, more importantly than to know him. I can stop any work just to know him. This is the most important thing in life. And I encourage you, face this as your truth, that I may know him, that I may know him. My time is up, but I pray for you, that the Spirit of the Lord will take you today and begin to open you up into depths of knowledge of him. As he fills your heart with this knowledge, may your eyes be open to see and may you embrace his truth and begin to live accordingly in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you. I'll see you on Monday. Have the best weekend ever.